can't ever remember not just being in love with music. My dad was a wonderful athlete, great baseball player, football. My mom was a cheerleader. Uh, even my brother it was a great baseball player, and I have an older half-brother who played college football. And I was this sensitive, artsy kid. But they were patient with me, and they nurtured it. I mean, they both, mom played the piano. Maybe they kind of grew up in a time where they didn't feel like it was allowed, and I'm, I'm lucky that I, that I was. And so it was in them somewhere, and it came out through me. I was in elementary school, and it was in the church choir, and there was an audition for a solo. And I sang it with a little fluty voice, and the choir director said, you got it, and I, that kind of kind of kicked it off, I suppose. In middle school, where we had electives, we got to choose what we would take, and I thought, well, let me give choir a try. After one year, I was about to quit. And my mom said, no, 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 you, you need to give this another try. Stuck with it for one more year, and that's when I really fell in love with it. I was real lucky uh, to have very patient uh, teachers that, that helped me through. In middle school, that was Carl Brown, who was just this kind man and much more patient with me than I deserve. In fact, there was actually talk uh, my eighth grade year about not allowing me to do choir in high school, particularly in choir. I got more trouble in choir than anywhere. It's funny, I've, I've, I've kind of thought about that since then, like why? The thing that I loved the most, and I think what it is, music really brought, it was gave me a focus for my emotions for all the stuff that in I think seventh or eighth grader would be dealing with. And as long as I was singing, it was fine. But then as soon as the music would stop, it's like, my emotions needed somewhere to go, and so they went in some really weird places. We got hauled into the principal's office, me and a good friend of mine, and the principal just looked us in the eye and said, tell me why I need to let you do choir in high school. And I just, because I love it, and it's choir is my life, and it's the only thing I care about it. They let me in, luckily. My first couple of years in high school were pretty much the same way. I had a wonderful choir director, Brett Farr, who was there for the four years I was in La Mesa. And, you know, some of the people I went to high school, we talk about just this little small town in West Texas and how lucky we were to have these really wonderful choir directors. And sometimes when I was there and being a little, you know, sensitive artsy kid in a small West Texas town, I always felt like, why me? Why am I here? Why aren't I in some big city like Dallas? But then I look back on it now and I think, how lucky you know, that I got to have these people in my life. About what led me to kind of what I do now, there really was one central event. There was an artist, a painter, who lived in La Mesa, which was kind of rare. I was over at his studio. My mom had taken me, we were looking at some of his art. And over in the corner, there was a piano and there was a manuscript paper. And I went over and I looked at the manuscript paper and I'm like, uh, what's this? And he said, oh, this is a piece I'm working on. And I'm like, wait, you're, you're composing this? And he said, yeah. And my little 16 year old brain just kind of went, Poof. I'm like, a composer. I'd always thought composers were, you know, well, first of all, most of them weren't alive anymore. Uh, or you, if you were going to be a composer, you had to be from New York or L.A. or London or Germany or Russia. You mean you can be from La Mesa, Texas and be a composer? And that was just crazy to me. And so I went home that night and started working on a piece. It was just horrible. It was just horrible. But my mom uh, saw that in me. And so what she did, she um, made no... Uh, staff paper for me by hand. She did the five lines and four spaces and did a treble clef and a bass clef and went to a printer and copied off like a hundred sheets of that for me. And I just, I just started and I said, mom, dad, this is what I want to do. And God bless them. They said, okay, we found me a voice teacher and I started taking piano. 16 is very late to start taking piano. Uh, it shows today but I, I muddled through. So I went to college at SMU, and the reason I went there was because of Lloyd Fouch. I had sung his music in high school, Music's Empire, Reconciliation, and once again, that was another one of those experiences where, you mean there's living composers, and, and some of them actually teach at universities somewhere, and 
when I saw that SMU brochure that came to our house, like a lot of, you know, and I'm like, Lloyd Fouch, he's alive. And, and he teaches at SMU in Dallas, that's not far. I wanna go there. And so I even did my, uh, my auditions there. He was a musical hero of mine. Then SMU just blew my mind. The, the professors, Barbara Brinson was uh, my music education professor and she was so loving, so nurturing. That was my degree was music education and she just fostered me and radically honest when I needed radical honesty. Cause I, you know, I had sung and I'd done recitals and been in operas in college, but there, there was never that aha moment of this is what you're supposed to do. I was doing my student teaching at an elementary school in inner city Dallas. And Dr. B came out to observe a lesson when the lesson was over and the class walked out and I went to the back of the room to visit with Dr. B and well, what'd you think? And she was crying and she said, um, Mark, I've never seen you like this before. There's a light in you. This is what you're supposed to do. And that was an amazing gift. And that's when I'm, that, that um, sharing music with peop young people in particular was what I was supposed to do. And I ended up being a, a music teacher in, in inner city Dallas for four years and love it. And it's, uh, I, it's made me who I am in so many ways. You don't get gifts like that very often. I'm grateful to her. In college, you know, I was a music education major and did vocal music. Every time there was any kind of project in any of the classes, be it music theory, uh, piano, my pro piano proficiency class, or we all have to take instrumental methods class, if I could ever shoehorn a composition component into that, I did. And even on choir tours, we, we would go all over the country and everybody would be visiting, playing cards, and I would be scrawling on, um, on my staff paper and my friends would make fun of me that I was their favorite composer because that's all that I did. So I guess I took that with me when I became an elementary music teacher. I taught kindergarten through fifth grade general music. And you know we used the music series, we had those books there, but there were definite gaps. And I still loved to to write and to create. And so one of the things that, that we needed was um, songs where the language was very simple, short, you know, very little uh, language, either in English or any other language, the kids would pick up the tune, uh, lickety split. <clears throat> but we didn't need you know, 500 words in a song. The other thing I wanted to do was help the kids be a part of the creative process too. At the time, there wasn't a lot of uh, resources about how to lead composition with kids. We would write a musical where the kids would create, and I would help them create. And every once in a while, I would write a song of my own and think, Hmm, I wonder what it'd be like to be published. That would be real. And then that kind of took hold of my brain a little bit. Then there was a, a music catalog that, that came in, in my box at the school. It was a, from a, a publisher who's not publishing anymore, but on the back page it was, are you a music teacher who would like to be a published composer? And I'm like, yes. We're looking for songs, song collections to add to our uh, existing recorder resources. And I'm like, okay, this is my shot. Because I had, I had submitted stuff to, to lots of publishers and then you send it off and you wait three to six months. I got to the point where I was really good at telling when it was the rejection letter. Too thin, rejection letter. Too thick, it's your whole thing back. So I had submitted a collection of about 10 songs and then that, that kind of window opened up Well, it was within you know three months out. And then I got this envelope and I'm like, hmm, no, wait a second. And my heart started to really beat fast. And I open it up. It says, Dear Mr. Burroughs, we are delighted. That's a good start. Delighted is a good start. Delighted to inform you, da 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 da, that it rose to the top of the pile. And, and I just about hit the floor and just started bawling. I called my uh, girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. So she came over with champagne and dessert, and we just celebrated. I was over the moon, over the moon. My elementary school kids, they were the first ones to perform the songs. And then when the collection came out, it takes everyone, it takes everything. They just, you know, it was a huge celebration. It was just great. I love writing for all ages. Um, children, I feel like I, I need to be an advocate for them. We were talking about writers that, that we admire and how that's part of it. Jim Papoulis is one. I admire not simply his musical expression, but he believes that that children really have something to say. He collaborates with them, and I, I believe that, that that's something that motivates me very much. Is uh, naming it with kids and uh, 
children need and want more than rainbows and butterflies. Where I am right now is helping children articulate the deepest, most sacred thoughts in their being, in their hearts and in their minds, and helping grown-ups see uh, the, the just wondrous personhood that, that children have.